Jesus. He's my love dog. Sven was thrown out of a moving car on a farm in Tennessee. Beaten and abused. I've played in many bands over the years, and I've never quite got the record deal I wanted. I never got a, a, a royalty check from any record company until I recorded this album with my dog Sven, Canine Fusion. Now, thanks to Sven, I receive a check from BMI every year. Believe it or not, my dog plays piano, bass, and guitar and sings human English. And I do the drums. You know, because of Sven, this CD's taken us national. We're, we're all over the world. We've had TV shows in Australia. We've been on National Geographic, Dogs with Jobs. I've been featured in the Blu-ray version of the movie Marley and Me. Sven changed my life. He put it on a whole new path. He's the reason that I met my wife. He's the reason that I have my dog training career the way it is today. I know dogs better than they know themselves. I could think a dog into a sit. I, could, I know dog body language because I'm just around them 24-7. Good boy, Charlie, say hi. Who loves you, Charlie? Get it? Good boy. Charlie, down. Working with dogs in different capacities as a veterinary assistant, living at veterinary hospitals, working with other trainers from protection to adversive training, all the way to positive training, what I do now. Sydney, come. Good girl, off. Oh. Good girl, down. That's a good girl. And watch this. When I want to examine her and check out her tummy and and have her relax and give her a massage, all I have to do is say, Sydney, bang, bang. Good girl, and that's what I'm talking about right there. Training just was a, a day job. I didn't think it was gonna take over. I was a drummer, I'll always be a drummer. I'm a drummer first and foremost. That's what I really do. Dog training just seemed to take off and it paid a lot better than drums. side of the family was quite eccentric. Probably my creativity came from my mom's side. We actually have footage of her performing a benefit to raise money for cancer. She was pretty young back then. Look at her go. You know in the 60s I think my dad was a Republican but then in the 70s he turned into a hippie and he's been cool ever since. You know my dad was the real dog lover of the family since I could remember our dog Charlie and Snoopy growing up as a kid. He just showed me really how to love and take care of a dog. Whereas my mother, she would take me more on nature hikes and I would learn, you know, about birds and ducks and wildlife and goats. You know, all little kids do silly things. One of the silly, stupid things I did when I was a kid was uh, I took a coffee can, a popsicle stick, garden hose, some grass, and gathered some of my dog's poop, stirred it all together and was making dog duty stew, I thought, you know. Uh, my mom came out because she heard me banging the can with the stick and she thought it sounded good. So I was tapping on things constantly. Uh, the table, the forks and knives on, on crystal. And my parents told me I was a hyper kid. They were really cool parents. They let me do whatever I wanted. I always grew up with pets. I had dogs, cats, pet rats. I had homing pigeons even. Until one day I came home and my dog Snoopy ate all my pigeons and my friend's pigeons. You know, dogs and pets were in my life since I could remember. Uh, I was always interested in how dogs viewed the world. I remember when I was a little kid just turning on the light, walking in my bedroom, and my dog would look at me like I had special powers. They're deep spiritual animals. You know, we've grown up with dogs probably five, 6,000 years, and the, the bond is so deep. If you gain a dog's trust, the connection can grow so deep. I, I feel sorry for people that never grew up with animals. It can enrich your life, and it's just a wonderful thing. And then you would, I'd make you be a dog in one of the cages too, and then I would pretend to go shopping for dogs at the pound, and I would look at all the dogs, and then you'd be like barking and begging, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't pick you. <laughs> and you would like really, you know, and so I would get like crackers and water, and I'd smush them all up, and I'd put like all kinds of weird food in them, and I'd put it in a bowl on the floor, and I'd make you eat it, and then I would say that I wouldn't adopt you unless you ate all the. That's horrible. <laughs>
you know, my sister was two years older than me, so I was the bratty little brother, you know, always getting kicked out of the room. But, you know, I had my own friends and my own things going on. From the age of eight to the age of 16, I surfed just about every day of my life. Sometimes two or three times a day. We would ditch school and go surfing. My mom would let us go one day a week and miss school, and my friend's dad would take us out of school another day. We'd go, you know, before school, ride like 10 miles to the beach. That's all I did, surf. My sister was the real musician. She, she was playing as a kid. And, uh, but me, I was surrounded by it and I'm grateful for that. She played guitar and sang ever since I could remember. She was singing in clubs at 15. She, she turned me on to bands, you know, like the, more of the New York, I guess you'd call it New York kind of rock and roll, like Lou Reed and Patti Smith and, you know, Iggy Pop and the Stooges and all the other kind of stuff. She was more into Roxy music. My dad brought me to see Led Zeppelin uh, at the Inglewood Forum when I was 13 with a friend. I remember he dropped me off and, I think to this day, you know, that was the, the, that's what really changed my life, to see him at Zeppelin back in 1976. Um, my dad, even though he didn't play, uh, he played stand-up bass in high school, but as an adult, he just had friends that were over all the time, jamming, rehearsing. My dad let people live with us. I think his name was Jim. He played drums and he lived with us, so there was a drum set in a, our guest room for a while, and we'd have rehearsal in the living room. Uh, I think it's the aesthetic of the drum that inspired me. It was just the, it wasn't just, it was everything. The rhythmic, I just loved the way drums looked and the, the wood, um, it's a very organic instrument. And I actually bought a house when I was 21. I was doing really well. I was a manager of sales for the LA Times, top salesman. And I met a, a guitar player and a bass player at that point and we formed a band called The Same. My brother-in-law got us a bunch of gigs in San Francisco and I found myself, you know, these young white kids playing in these all black blues clubs in this real crusty rough part of San Francisco and just getting like a standing ovation and you know that's when I realized that hey I actually can play but I never had a lesson. I didn't know how to count, I didn't know how to read and I thought maybe it's time I go to school and study a little bit. If I really want to pursue this, you know, I, I better learn what I'm doing. I took a year off and I, I quit the, uh, the band and I quit my job at the LA Times and I sold my house and I went to drum school for a year. Uh, right before I went to PIT, the drum school, I had only saved $1,000, but I needed a drum set bad. The, my little rinky-dink set was falling apart. So I went to the horse races and I actually won $4,500 and I bought the most beautiful Gretsch drum set. Have big desert parties or just two or three drummers would set up. We would you know, take them up to the mountains and just have fun drumming with uh, you know, little drum circles. Bang! New universe dancing. My heart's a drum, keeping me alive. An emotional, spiritual, and physical drum. Rhythmic energy and thunder. Rhythm is what makes me. Lightning fusing heaven to earth. An attraction to the tide, to the moon and the sun. The creator of our planet, the first drum. Primal vibrations of a baboon pounding his chest. Rhythm is what makes me. Animals migration. Seasons, light and darkness. Entrainment, connection, communication. The rudimental drum rhythm of an army. The mysterious heart. Blood flows through my body. The way the rivers flow through the sea. Rhythm is what makes me. I lived in Hollywood for quite a while. It was uh, before I moved to Nashville. I had a lot of fun, a lot of partying days. Played all the clubs in Hollywood. Played with many bands. I played with a band called Plastic Cadillac. I remember I had a patent leather jumpsuit, custom made at some uh, clothing store on Melrose. The singer was wearing like panties and, uh, you know, dressed like a girl with high heels and makeup. We were almost like a glam, goth, uh, crazy band. I played with dozens of different, from punk to you name it. And then, you know, it was time to leave California. So I figured I'd, I, Nashville, I had a great opportunity because my brother-in-law, Darren Chadwick, got me the job at the recording studio. When the recording studio moved to Nashville, that was my opportunity to leave California for the first time. And I had a place to stay. And uh, I met my love dog, Sven. Sven was thrown out of a moving car on a farm in Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee, right outside of Nashville. First day I was there, these 11 year old girls were craw crying and crying and walking down the road in tears. I was pulling back from the grocery store. I didn't know anybody. These girls saw him thrown from a moving car. 
he was hurt. His feet were so tender. He was obviously in pain. He was full of fleas and like uh, foxtails and burrs and he was dirty and he was crying. So I took him to the vet as soon as I could. But there was an ice storm. It lasted, it seemed two or three days and it was pitch dark. And I remember I left Sven at the hospital and when I went to check on him, they told me they tried to give him a bath and he bit somebody, they had him in this cage. It was a dark, desolate, like just square box and all the power was out. When I got there, they had a rabies stick, which is a long pole with a noose on the end, but they were trying to poke him with the back end, like, cause he was attacking and charging them. And it was, it was horrifying. I walked in there and I had to use a flashlight and gloves and the flashlight freaked him out more. He was just, he was charging me. And, he was nut. It was a Jekyll and Hyde. But all the doctors there told me to put him to sleep. He was just like, <laughs> charging at me, snapping his teeth, and I, I don't even remember how I got him out, but I got him out somehow. And I always had doubts, like what happened to this dog in the first few months of his life? And I took him back a couple days later from the vet and cuddled with him the first night, and out came this. <laughs> And I went, ah! and I panicked. But at the same time, he had the sweetness to him. So when everybody was telling me to put him to sleep, I just knew there was good in this dog and I really wanted to figure it out. And ever since I was a little boy, I had this interest in dogs, just trying to figure out what they think. And it just all came together for me. You know, I just had this dog and I was determined to figure out what made this dog tick. You know, right when I got to town, I started looking through the magazines and found a guitar player with the same interest. So we hit it off right away. And we started the uh, the band, my groovy friend. We found a bass player and he was great. He was only with us for about just less than a year. And he had enough of a crazy guitar player, alcoholic attitude and a uh, great guitar player though. You know, I love jamming with him. We had a lot in common uh, musically. Our work ethic was strong because we would work till three or four in the morning we, we lived this and breathed this. It was all we cared about was our band, our music. How are we going to be the next greatest band in the world? And we really believed in ourselves. We, we, if we weren't playing or rehearsing, we were promoting the band, handing out flyers, doing promotional things, um, getting drunk, going to bars, getting in trouble. Uh, but it was hard work. <laughs> right when I got Sven, there was always equipment around and he was always guarding the equipment. People couldn't get near it and pick it up and I thought it was kind of cool at first but it, it ended up being a problem. What I was going to do with Sven when we had rehearsal or we had a show. So anytime we had people over, of course I had to watch out for Sven because he wouldn't just charge him and go after him but if they would try to pick him up or touch him or move him, he would bite. Back then I did a lot of things wrong. I put him in some volatile situations, parties, loud noises. Although I was always concerned about the sound, I asked all the vets I worked for um, if it was dangerous to have a dog in the room rehearsing. And they told me, you know, if he doesn't look disturbed, he's fine. If he's laying there calm, don't worry about it. I was afraid that other people would walk in the room, uh, you know, people were coming and going all the time when we would rehearse, and I didn't want him to bite anybody, so I'd have to give him something better to do in the corner. So I would give him stuffed marrow bones full of cheese whiz and salmon pate and liverwurst and cream cheese and honey and peanut butter and he loved that sticky stuff to chew. And I tried everything to get rid of this growl when I lived in Nashville and I worked for some trainers and we did all the wrong things. I don't even want to tell you the things I did to get rid of it and I know I made it worse. But finally I decided I'd make this a trick and I'd try to get it on cue and get this crazy growl, get control over it by turning it into a trick, getting an on switch and an off switch. So I was able to to turn it on and turn it off. Nashville was a great place to live. There was a park, Centennial Park, and there was always a drum circle on the weekends, and I'd bring Sven and let him off leash, and we had bonded enough that he would always come back, and he was really good with other dogs. He didn't have a problem with, with other dogs. He loved to chase squirrels, he loved to chase birds, and um, I let him go one time after a flock of birds. They all flew away, one of them was hurt on the ground, and Sven was running after this hurt bird. I thought he was gonna kill the bird. I was running after him yelling, no, no, stop. I didn't even have a, a good enough recall at that time, but he was running after this bird. I, I ran over there, he got to the bird and he stopped and he started crying and looking at me and licking the bird and nudging it with his nose and whimpering, and he knew the bird was hurt and he didn't do a thing. So I knew that this dog had a good heart. I had Sven the whole time. He lived in a soundproof doghouse and lofts and warehouses. He's been on the road. He's been living in and out of rehearsal studios, living off catfish we caught out of the rivers in Tennessee, living off 35 cent shell hot dogs. Sven's had a hard life, but he loves the music scene. So I was a big 
Super Ray Charles fan, and Sven would lay on the keyboard and he'd growl and I'd throw sunglasses on him and he looked like Ray Charles. But I never really thought about making him play. He was always growling and making noises when anybody would get near that piano. And I could never touch the knob. I couldn't even reach and turn it on or off. He would go, you know, like he wanted to bite my finger. Um, he was trying to tell me something about music. And once I taught him how to play, he was a dog father of rock and roll. So my parents came to visit me in Nashville and I, I picked him up at the airport and I had Sven in the car and he just went after him, tried to attack him. As soon as my dad started driving, he, my dad pulled over and I had to you know, hold him down and get a towel out of the back and put it over his face and he just, he was just a nut. And then five minutes later, he'd be cuddling with somebody. We had a, a loft where the whole band lived in the loft. You know, the bass player lived in a tent and my dog had a soundproof doghouse. And we had makeshift little sections where we lived, bands all around us. You know, my parents saw me struggling, but at the same time, I had one of the best shows of my life that night. We opened for a band called the Dixie Dregs. Got a standing ovation. We didn't even have a singer. Uh, although my parents, in a way, they really did discourage me. They didn't want me to be a drummer and turn out like their loser friends. But they, they, they were, they supported the arts. They just didn't want their son to be a drummer. So after years of being on the road with this band, working like a dog, I needed a vacation. It was time to move on. The ego of the guitar player was intense. He was an alcoholic. The art wasn't worth the stress that I was under, and I said, I had enough of you guys, I'm gone. And my parents' house was the nice place to stop on the way up north, and uh, I brought Sven along. He was still a bit crazy, although he'd mellowed out some. Sven was starting to say these words, and my parents didn't believe how talented he was. They just thought he was a nut. I, I learned about massage, and I was massaging my dog, and that would really mellow him out. So when my parents said, you know, this dog is crazy, I showed him that with just some touch, some simple touching techniques, I could get him to melt and relax. So as I was massaging my dog, I noticed that I could get him to say words like love, 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 or I love you if I would do it a certain way. I love you. I love you too. My dog needed a vacation too. He slept like a baby. Um, you know, people used to wonder that he, he would dream funny. And you know, I've had other dogs that dream where they kick and scream and look uncomfortable like they're, you know, I don't know what dogs dream, but I imagine they're chasing squirrels or rabbits. Sven was always at peace when he slept. He never had a bad dream. So I didn't have a plan when I was headed to San Francisco. I basically didn't know anybody. My sister had a friend that owned a piano warehouse in Oakland. So they let me uh, sleep at the piano warehouse, which was interesting because Sven was surrounded by hundreds of pianos. Um, I was there about a week or two before I landed a job at a vet hospital right on the beach in San Francisco for this old hippie doctor. Wonderful guy, I learned so much. I was doing more than just restraining dogs and cleaning kennels. I was doing all the blood work and x-rays and assisting on surgeries and even doing euthanasias. And I was really getting involved in medicine, but there was times I was still just uh, doing fecal samples. And I, and I would think back when I was a kid making dog duty stew, and here I am an adult working at a vet playing with poop. It's the full circle. <laughs> I got to live inside the animal hospital. I showered at the animal hospital. My backyard was shared with a pig. Sven fell in love with this pig. The pig fell in love with Sven. The pig's name was Porcina. You know, I think Porcina might have been Sven's first groupie. But I don't kiss and tell, and neither does Sven. So the whole year I lived in San Francisco, I was auditioning for bands. I finally found a pretty good band. We played our first big show um, on Hate Street. I think it was on Hate Street. Anyways, we played our first big show. And uh, the next day, my old band called me back. I don't know how they tracked me down. They said, we've moved to Chicago. We miss you. We've auditioned dozens of drummers. Uh, we have shows lined up. We've got a place to stay, a rehearsal studio. 
and please come back. So I, I did and I, I left the band I just joined and had to rejoin my guys in Chicago. So when I met my band, they um, all lived in one little studio apartment. This was the bass player and his wife and the bass player's brother who was our manager. Um, guitar player, his girlfriend, all their pets, there was five or six pets plus Sven and all of our equipment and it turned out pretty good when David Letterman came to town to uh, to do his show so I called him kind of lied and I said I have a dog that plays piano and does a Ray Charles impersonation and they called me right back and they said can you be here tomorrow at one o'clock and I said sure and I hung the phone up and I realized Sven's never played piano in his life he just laid on it and guarded it but he really didn't play it so I luckily found a piano for three dollars and fifty cents at a yard sale and uh, we practiced that evening and Sven actually played pretty well. And we went on the show and I, I thought we were gonna make it. I thought they were gonna pick us, but unfortunately we didn't make it. When Sven first started playing piano, of course there's always critics and there were people that would wonder why I was making my dog work. And you know, I responded by the fact that Sven enjoyed piano. He loved it. He was guarding the piano since a puppy. He loved to lay on that piano. He figured out quickly that when he hit it and it made noise, he got treats and dinner and breakfast. And that was his favorite thing to do. Now dogs have had jobs for thousands of years. They were bred to work from hunting, from protecting and guarding. And it's just another job. You do something, you get something. I work for a paycheck, my dog works for a paycheck. Chicago was another pretty rough neighborhood. We rehearsed all hours of the night and it was some pretty pretty scary streets. So having Sven, you know, I taught him one trick and it was called piranha. And I'd say piranha and he would attack his leash and start biting it and growling and that would freak out just about any vagrant, you know, two, three in the morning walking down the alley when they saw that dog attacking his leash, people would run the other way. We played a lot of great shows. All the big places you could play in Chicago and we were slowly recording our album trying to get it together, writing songs, and um, it was starting to turn back how it used to be. Basically, we had, it just, it wasn't healthy living with these guys. I just knew it was enough was enough. Should I say all that stuff? I don't think I should. I don't want to get petty about it. Like, I just want to say creative differences. It's just easier. It was a horrible fight, horrible breakup. It was like a divorce, but you weren't divorcing one person. You were divorcing your whole band, the entourage, Everybody I knew knew me as the drummer of my groovy friend. I didn't even have an identity of Steve Brooks. It didn't seem like I was me. And I just felt all alone all of a sudden. I had nothing. I had no, I didn't have anybody except Sven. And I had enough living in Chicago, even though I did love the city. I said, Sven, pack up your things. We're going to California. Surf's up. Let's party. Good boy. Are you crazy? <laughs> Say hello. There you go. I love you. Good boy. Kisses. Kisses. piano he would growl he would bark and it looked a little scary but again I was taking all this crazy energy and at least channeling it into one direction so for quite a few years now I was training Sven and asking questions at all the vets I worked for and all the trainers I worked for and I was obsessed on trying to figure out how to fix my crazy dog and I realized that I was actually a pretty good dog trainer Sven Sven down good boy Sven good boy sit Good boy. Stick him up. Good boy. Get me a beer! Oh, 
Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you. Good boy. That's very good. That's real good. What do you want to do now? Let's hear the radio now. We'll dance with you if you turn it on. Go, get it. Go turn on the stereo. That's the TV spinner. You don't want to hear the radio? I want to hear it. Turn it back on. Turn it back on. Turn on the radio. Not the CD. I love you. Tell the daddy you love me. Love me. I love you too. I love you too, Spender. Yes, I do. You're a good boy. This is Elvis impression. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. George Burns, remember that guy? Do the John Lennon. Should he be on the piano for this? Rastafari love dog. And I realized I had the most difficult dog on the planet and I'd been training him pretty well. So I decided to start doing it for other people and I got a job at a, a chain of a local pet store. It was a big chain and I was doing group classes all over town. And before you know it, I, I left that, I went on my own, I started Steve Brooks Canine U, moved to Silver Lake just a few miles east of Hollywood and business has been booming ever since. <laughs> Ben became the first graduate of Steve Brooks Canine U. You know, he was my protege. I started with him, and before you know it, I've trained thousands of dogs. Don't move at all. Just keep completely still. No, you keep moving. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> You're fired. Stay. Keep still. Keep still. Okay, now we catch him. Touch! Go get Go get the car! Touch! And anytime he gets crazy, all I really have to do is just touch him right here and he stops. I can do that. And then I just do that. Or I can do this, and then I can say, hot dog, chicken. All the traveling and moving and packing up from here to there. By the time we moved back, he was comfortable wherever we lived, as long as we were together. Like they say, home is where the heart is.
So I was working as a real dog trainer finally, getting paid, had my own business starting, and this dog came into my life, a, a pit bull Doberman American Bulldog mix, and it was basically this uh, beautiful woman called me up and said, come help me train this crazy dog, and uh, ever since, uh, I've been with this lady, it's my wife Yasmin, and my dog Lagali. You know, I did have some concern that Sven was going to have problems when my new wife, or my new girlfriend at the time, and my new dog at the time, when they came into the house, I thought maybe Sven would have a problem. Sven was happy as can be. He, he wasn't jealous. He was fine. But when we finally started to cook for each other and went out a few times, it was food that really brought us together. Food was our common ground. The other thing we had in common was our dogs, of course. Sven and Legali. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Legali, sit. No. Okay, here we go. No. no. I'm going to ignore that. She's barking at me. I'm just going to ignore it. That doesn't work. I want her to wave goodbye, not to bark at me. We'll try it again. Good girl. Sit. Good girl. If she barks, I'm going to walk away again. But if she does bye-bye, she's got to keep her butt on the ground, too. No. See? Bye-bye. I'm going to ignore it and feed the cat instead. Good fuego. Good kitty. This is Joe Pete. Good boy, Joe. Joe is a rescue dog. I've actually had him a while now already. I'm just hanging out with my dogs, that's all. I'm just hanging out with them all. Good boy, sister. Good boy. He's doing well, but he's a, he's a takes food hard. He climbs counters, he digs in trash. He's, he just loves food. And uh, so I taught him some self-control. Want to sit? Do you want to dance for me? Dance. Good girl. Oh, good girl. What's up, Joe? Bang, bang. Stay. Stay. Down. Stay. Stay. We did like 20 minute lavender massages uh, where he would be smelling lavender oil and getting a full massage. Stay. Stay. And now he really accepts being handled and touched. His nails, I just did those last week. I couldn't touch his feet when he got here. Couldn't even touch his toes. And um, he didn't trust anybody. He was a street dog. Well, he's a sweetheart. Joe's a good boy. People with high hostility levels have higher heart rate responses, and Sven was sometimes quite agitated, so I always wondered if his heart was beating fast. So when Sven was about seven or eight, I went and did what was called a geriatric profile. That's a, some blood work, so you have a baseline, so when he gets older, you know how things are changing. And when I did that first blood test, it was off the chart. His liver looked destroyed. He had a genetic copper storage disease. Basically, copper got stored in his liver and it wouldn't get out. He was unexaminable. We couldn't get him on a table. You couldn't even lift him up to check his heart or even look in his ear. I was the only one that could really handle him. I was a vet tech, so I handled thousands and thousands of dogs and cats over the years, and I'm not exaggerating, Sven was the worst. He would fight to the bitter end. You couldn't, you couldn't win. You would actually kill him if you, because he wouldn't submit. I mean, if you were trying to win, he would fight until he was out of breath and he, was, he would die, basically. He would not give up. He was a fighter. My name is Chris Cobble. I'm with Mobile Vet, a veterinary house call service. My name is Miguel Salazar. I'm the veterinary technician for Mobile Vet. 
and I had the pleasure of working with Sven for several years. When we would work with Sven, it was very important that I performed a thorough physical exam on each time I saw him because he had these problems, you know, arthritis, liver problems, copper storage disease, problems with his nails, cancer, you know, tumors and things. He was particularly sensitive over his back end where he was arthritic, but I had to feel those joints that were arthritic to tell whether it was getting better or worse or responding to the medications. And then with the overgrown nails, we, well, we had to hold the paws and trim the nails. Sven was all fight. He was different than all other dogs because he'll fight you the whole time that I had to wear these the whole time. And he bruised my knuckles and hands several times just biting the gloves. Never physically breaking skin, but you know, he would have, would he had the chance. He was biting so much, anything in front of his face, see, Sven would bite. And, and he was going for pain. He wasn't just like trying to warn you. He was going, and he actually bit through his lip, his own lip, and his teeth went through his own lip. And then he was stuck with his, his lip caught and his canine sticking out his cheek. And that was disturbing, so we had to catch him again. And I had my workout for today when I worked with Sven, but yet it was fun. It's one of the most memorable experiences I've had at Mobile Vet compared to other dogs I've had to deal with. It turns out that I went in for a physical one day after not having insurance for many years, living on the road with my band. And I finally was back in Hollywood and I got insurance and started to get on my feet. Kana and you was taken off. And at a physical, they said, get to the cardiologist immediately. And I was in shock and I still didn't know what was going on until they said, you need to have heart surgery immediately. Your valve is leaking. It was the worst time of my life. I almost died. When I woke up, I had seven liters of fluid surrounding my heart. I didn't know what to do when I was going in for my heart surgery. I thought, what happens if I can't come back? Who's going to take care of Sven? Was it selfish of me to think, should I put Sven to sleep if I can't make it back? And the truth is, there was nobody that could really handle him in a situation of emergency. If he broke a nail or hurt his foot or something bad happened, you had to pick him up and take him to the vet. He was a dangerous dog. Dangerous dog. He was a dangerous dog. They sent me back to the hospital, I passed out in the elevator, was there for another week, almost died. My heart is in atrial fibrillation 100% of the time, which means it doesn't beat in rhythm. I have a pacemaker that helps keep it in sync. I also have a valve that will need replacing someday. My valve is off a human. It's off a cadaver. It's called a homograph. I had recently met Yasmin, and she was there for me, and Sven was there for me and our other dog Ligali was there for me, and all of my clients. I had so much love from all the pets I'd trained. And then when I got home, there were so many restrictions. I have 60 stairs. I couldn't do my stairs. It took me about an hour to get up my stairs, one stair at a time. And of course, I couldn't let Sven jump on me, and he wanted to see me. And, uh, but he listened well enough that I can keep him at bay. And, and uh, we were cuddling. I couldn't let him in bed, though, for a few nights. I don't really remember if it was weeks or months before I could even start drumming again. I had him playing piano, then I taught him guitar. And then bass. Sit, sit. Good boy! And he was getting these uh, words coming out of his mouth, and that's what I call canine fusion. And now I'm not playing with guitar players, I'm playing with my dog.
He loves playing the bass guitar. I love, love. He really does love playing the bass guitar. Good boy. I was walking around with this idea in my head for many years. How do I put together a CD with dog noises? They make so many beautiful sounds. They grunt, they howl, they hiss, they tooth snap, they mew, they they bark, they groan, they groan, all these different noises dogs make. It's beautiful. I did the CD on my computer, I had a little mixing board in my living room, we recorded a little bit at the engineer's house, and we rented a studio for a day or two, I put it all together. You're getting ready to mix the record, good boy. <laughs> good boy. It's fine. Good job, rock and roll love dog. Yeah. Sven's doing all the guitar, Sven's playing all the bass, Sven's playing all the piano. Every growl you hear is from his gut or from Legali's gut. We have about five or six other dogs squeaking, whining, grunting, snorting, sneezing. It's all dogs. I'm the only human and I'm doing the drums. doing the drums, Sven's doing all the rest. And it's it's with with a lot of intensity and love and energy. And I could guide him up and down like a conductor. I could get him to go fast, I can get him to go slow, I can go to this side of the keyboard, he touched my hand, I go to this side of the keyboard, he touched my hand. First take spender, all right. It might have looked easy, but trying to play drums with him was even harder. So I'd have to do it again, a lot of separate tracks. I'd rather I'd take his vocals first and maybe play a drum track to his vocal pattern, or vice versa, and I mixed it up a bit. Make little loops out of uh, his vocal tracks. Maybe he would say, glove, 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 and I would repeat it like glove, glove, glove. My dog can do it all. I have one friend, Scott Wolf, helping me engineering this. Who's helping Sven? Do yeah. you, you, like, you like the sound like that? Or do uh, you think he needs a little more of this? What do you think, bud? Come on. But you don't like it? You don't like any of it? Come on. I think music. I think dog. There you go, canine fusion.
when a dog is senior or geriatric, just even taking them for a walk in a different direction or, or adding a new trick to their repertoire can can grow brain cells. It can literally do that. So you're, you're actually helping a dog rather than just sitting around doing nothing by teaching them new tricks and new games. So what if he pounds the piano to get treats? It, it's better than laying around sleeping all day. Spandoli, you want some breakfast? Breakfast? You're very good looking, baby D. Before I knew it, the phone was ringing. We were getting booked gigs everywhere before the CD was even done. Once it was completed, I had National Geographic come to my house. They filmed Sven do a live show at a club on Sunset. I started getting calls from uh, Jay Leno, from, um, what's that guy? Jimmy Kim I got. I started getting calls from Jimmy Kimmel, from Ellen DeGeneres, from Sharon Osbourne, from David Letterman. David Letterman now was calling me saying, can you bring your dog to play on in New York? But at that point, my dog was too old to travel and I had to say no, it was the twilight years of his life. One of our last final trips was up north and we hit all the dog beaches going all the way up the northern coast to Eureka. There's my love dog, Svanduli, to the beach. There they go. There she goes, good listener. Good, good. Good love dog. Good love dog. Hello baby D. To the beach. To the beach. Good boy. Beautiful baby, look at that. Love dog. Smile for the camera. Good boy. Spend the love dog. Good boy. But here was the sad part. His liver isn't what got him in the end. He started to get huge tumors that would get in the way when he would lay and sleep. They were the size of golf balls. But even worse than that, his arthritis. He couldn't squat to go to the bathroom. He couldn't balance himself. He couldn't hold himself up. And that's when I saw the dignity was lost. And I just felt like my poor boy, just if he can't hold himself up to go poop and pee anymore, you have to make a decision in life. And I had to put Sven down myself. I had my mobile vet come over but I was actually the one who gave him the shot because I didn't want him to fight on those last few breaths with a vet. He was much better with me. So it wasn't easy. You can know someone your whole life. If you turn around and they're gone. single continent of the world with humans. I wanted to be buried with my dog Sven.
by the time that Sven passed, I was booked months in advance with clients' dogs. And the commitment was there. Before I knew it, I was training a lot of rescue dogs. There was this dog, Smoke. He was a Katrina survivor. He was trapped in his house for five weeks. And when the military finally let people back in, I guess the insurance adjuster broke the window and Smoke was standing on a table and the water had risen up to his nose. And uh, a woman rescued him and I've been working with Smoke for a while. how to play piano because I realized that it, you channel some of that crazy energy a dog has and it gets them tired. They have fun. Music is soothing to the soul. And music lives on. Music lives on. Music is music lives on. Music is soothing to the soul.